turn the floor over to the Tibetan uh, Canadian Tibet Committee and the Executive Director from there. Uh, you'll have five minutes, and I'll attempt to give you a signal at the one-minute mark. Uh, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, committee members. I deeply appreciate this opportunity to speak with you on this important matter of Tibetan language and education. The Canada Tibet Committee is an independent, nonpartisan uh, association of Tibetans and non Tibetans from across Canada. Uh, founded in 1987, its mandate is to promote human rights of Tibetans living under Chinese rule. <clears throat> As committee members will know, uh, the right to education is protected in uh, both the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention on the Rights of Child. Both of these treaties explicitly guarantee that minority groups uh, must not be denied use of their own language, either in community or otherwise. Further, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights states that individuals have rights to self-determination including social and cultural development. Here in Canada, uh, the federal government supports efforts by indigenous, in, indigenous peoples to reclaim and revitalize their linguistic heritage, in part by adopting the Indigenous Language Act in 2019. In the province of Quebec, it has been more than 40 years since, <clears throat> since that children uh, in that province be educated in the French language until the end of their secondary studies. It is also interesting to note that the government of China has adopted its regional national autonomy law, which clearly states in the Article 37 that the organs of self-government of national autonomous areas shall independently develop education for their nationalities and shall, whenever possible, use textbook in their own languages and use languages as the medium of instruction. Despite such guarantees, however, uh, a suite of policies imposed across the whole of China by the central government under the pretext of poverty elevation or ecological protection have reinforced the ongoing assault on the Tibetan language and cultural tradition. Such policies include various nomad relocation schemes, the school consolidation policy, and the bilingual education policy. These policies have, in effect, reduced the ability of Tibetan lang children to access schooling in their own language. As witnesses have explained in detail before this committee in the previous meeting. A few years ago, Global Affairs Canada funded a project to support efforts by the Tibetan exiled community in India and Nepal to deliver quality education in the Tibetan language. Notwithstanding the many differences in the broader context, the project itself provided valuable lessons about challenges faced when promoting Tibetan language in the face of different dominant language. For this reason, Canada is well placed to take the lead on this issue. Therefore, in conclusion, we wish to make the following recommendations for the committee's consideration. Number one, open a dialogue with the appropriate counterparts from the National People's Congress on the matter of minority language and education in Tibet. Number two, invite visiting parliamentarians from China to indigenous communities and to Quebec in order to share Canadian experiences regarding the protection and promotion of minority languages. Number three, support academic research aimed at identifying the impacts that resettlement and education policies in Tibet have had or might have on the vibrancy of Tibetan language and culture. Number four, encourage the Canadian Embassy in Beijing to develop Canada Fund project related to Tibetan language education, including support for Tibetan uh, language lending libraries or training of Tibetan language teachers. And finally, number five, uh, advocate on behalf of Tibetan human rights defenders who uphold linguistic rights. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Surchin. That's uh, right, in, right in the time there for sure. So uh, we'll now move on to the uh, senior researcher with the Tibetan Action Institute. Uh, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you. I would like to thank the distinguished members of the committee for this opportunity. 
among all the tools of colonial dispossession wielded by European settlers against indigenous populations in North America, residential schools stand out for the scope, scale, and persistence of their impact. Under the guise of providing education, these boarding establishments removed indigenous children from their homes, erased their cultures and languages, and left a lasting legacy of multi-generational trauma that haunts indigenous communities to this day. This 19th century colonial practice is being quietly resurrected on the Tibetan plateau by the Chinese government. Two years ago, after hearing about children being forced into state-run board, state boarding schools in parts of eastern Tibet, my colleagues at Tibet Action Institute began investigating the matter. After months of research, they arrived at the disturbing conclusion that approximately 800,000 children, that's 78% of all Tibetan students aged 6 to 18, are living in residential boarding schools. 800,000 children, this staggering statistic does not include the more than 100,000 Tibetan children aged 4 to 6 who are believed to be in boarding preschools. In these boarding institutions, children are put through a highly politicized curriculum designed to sever their ties to their religion and culture, strip them of their mother tongue, and methodically replace their Tibetan identity with a Chinese one. The residential school system sits at the center of China's new solution to the Tibet problem. Whereas previous administrations under Hu Jintao, Jiang Zemin, and Deng Xiaoping balanced political repression with a degree of ethnic accommodation toward Tibetans, Xi Jinping's China has opted for an all-out eliminationist approach. This new approach is grounded in the ultra-nationalist notion that the only route to political stability is cultural uniformity and ethnic homogeneity. In the past, Beijing believed the best way to solve the nationalities problem was to afford non-Han minorities a range of special protections and cultural accommodations. But following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, Chinese public intellectuals like Ma Rong and Hu Anggang began to argue that special treatment for minority communities somehow undermined Chinese nation building. They called for a highly interventionist form of party-directed cultural nationalism. What Beijing now seeks to eliminate is not just separatist ideology, but the separate identity of Tibetans. Dissent never went unpunished under Beijing, but now even difference is criminalized. Among all the features of Tibetan identity, language is what most effectively unites Tibetans across the plateau. The Tibetan language forms the bedrock of one of the great civilizations of Asia, with a written history dating back over a millennium and an oral literature that goes back even further. It is also home to the largest body of canonical Buddhist literature in the world. Of all the markers of a distinct identity, language is the central pride of the Tibetan people. For Xi Jinping's China, this is precisely why the Tibetan language must be eradicated. And what better tool for that task than the residential school system? In all schools across the plateau, Tibetan has been replaced by Mandarin Chinese as the medium of instruction. Beijing has deceptively labeled this new policy bilingual education, but there is nothing bilingual about the system. Tibetan has been demoted to second or third language status in its own native homeland. This is literally a highway to mother tongue erosion. To make it worse, China has shuttered scores of local and private schools preemptively destroying all village-level alternatives to the consolidated boarding schools. Ironically, two months ago, when UN experts in Geneva grilled the Chinese delegation, Chinese officials defended the mandatory boarding policy by claiming that there were no schooling alternatives in rural Tibet. Guess what? They themselves had destroyed all those local alternatives that existed. At the same time, at the same event, when asked about the use of Mandarin as the medium of instruction in Tibet, Chinese officials said that the Tibetan language doesn't have the right words for teaching math and science. This is a blatantly racist and fictitious argument. All languages, when they meet new subjects for the first time, face challenges that can be overcome. 
the Chinese language itself faced the same problems in the recent past, and they managed pretty well, borrowing thousands of terminology from Japanese and Russian. Tibetan has by and large solved some of this problem too. Meanwhile, the boarding system is causing a major upheaval in the social, psychological, cultural, and linguistic structures of Tibetan life. We are already seeing the early results of this colonial policy. Tibetan children below a certain age are fast becoming native Mandarin speakers, which means they can no longer converse meaningfully with their parents and not even communicate with their grandparents. In Tibet, as in many traditional societies, grandparents play a seminal role in shaping children's overall psychological development and orienting their cultural worldview. If children inherit genes from their parents, it can be said they inherit culture from their grandparents. This thank colonial you, system, you. I'll be concluding, yeah, thank you. This colonial system is clearly designed to stem the transmission of culture from one generation to the next. Thankfully, the world is beginning to take action and take note. Two months ago, the UN sent a strong communication to Beijing on the issue. Yesterday, the German government officially called for an end to this system. My recommendation to the Canadian government is to publicly condemn this consolidated boarding institution and to call on the Chinese government to halt this system and allow the reopening of village level local and private schools. I finally request the Canadian government to sanction Chinese leaders and officials responsible for this heinous policy, including the intellectual architects responsible for developing and implementing this system. Thank you. Thank you. We will now be hearing from the senior researcher from Tibet Watch. Uh, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. Thank you for having me on behalf of Tibet Watch. I would like to thank all the members of the committee for your, uh, for your attention on this urgent matter and to the interpreter for making this communication possible. Firstly, I must make a note on the atmosphere of fear and surveillance under which Tibetans and Site Tibet live every single day. Ever since the spate of 2008 freedom protests and the self immolations from 2009, Tibet was effectively turned into a police state. Rural villages, cities, crossroads, community halls, monasteries, border crossing areas, chat groups and social media are all monitored by police. The Chinese Communist Party says it is for social stability. Meetings are convened to announce unilateral decisions. Tibetans inside are warned to cut off their ties with their friends and family living in exile and diaspora. Old age people with knowledge of family history are interviewed to extract information about Tibetans living outside. Huge cash rewards are promised for reports on communication between those inside and outside, and police visit homes and warn aging parents to tell, to tell the children in exile to stop going to protest, calling for freedom in Tibet. What is suppressed at home is repressed abroad. What then is the purpose, purpose of school in an occupied country? A young refugee girl aged 15 who recently escaped to India from Eastern Tibet told us about her time at her minority boarding secondary school. We wake up early around four to five in the morning and start morning exercises like running in the playground all under the close watch of surveillance cameras. The medium of instruction is mainly Chinese, except for Tibetan language class, the rest of the subjects are taught in Chinese language. Tibetan language class is optional and marks in the Tibetan exam are not even counted in the final exam score. She belongs to the top class of students who scored highest, but they don't get the chance to visit home on weekends like others. The best teachers give them classes, but only 10 out of 50 teachers at the school are of Tibetan origin teaching Tibetan language. A couple of other newly arrived refugees from Eastern Tibet also echoed the same observation, adding that Tibetan uh, naming a school Tibetan is just for the namesake and that there is no career and scope for jobs in a market driven society where Chinese language proficiency is the main requirement. In between this structural injustice, Tibetans have carefully and consistently carved out spaces for Tibetan education, private school, online language chat groups and home tuition, but these spaces are also rapidly shrinking. For example, in July 2021, Sengdruk Tatsi, a school founded with government permission, was forcibly shut down without any official clarification. Its students were then enrolled into local state-run schools, whilst orphans without fixed domiciliation faced many difficulties. A Tibetan teacher at the school was deeply disturbed by the closure and unable to eat, but she was detained. 
The same year, Gelden Geta, another renowned Tibetan school, was ordered to change the curriculum and medium of instruction in Chinese, take all exams in Chinese, or face shutdown. Then came the replacement of Tibetan textbooks with that of Chinese. Parents in Darlok Township in Golok were told that from September 2021 onwards, all their children must go to school only with the newly introduced textbooks in Chinese. Two youngsters expressed concerns about the future impact of this decision in an online chat group, but they were both detained. Another teenager in Ngaba County was also taken into custody after he submitted a petition against the Chinese medium of instruction and refused to join a propaganda meeting about praising the CCP. Shortly after the schools opened in September 2021 in Markham County, three children aged 11, 15, and 16 who expressed unhappiness about the lack of Tibetan classes were arrested from their boarding school and taken to a so-called Reform Through Education Center under the pretext of needing psychological counseling. The Chinese government also issued two other notices in 2021, promoting Mandarin Chinese as the national common language in preschool kindergartens and to reduce the burden of homework and off-campus tuition. But this double reduction, so to speak, means that off-campus tuitions in Tibetan language or any other subjects by Tibetans face scrutiny and closure. The boarding school is also deeply intertwined with state policies that displace nomads from their ancestral lands, known in Tibet Autonomous Region as Extremely High Altitude Ecological Resettlement Program. By 2025, entire villages in their hundreds are going to be moved hundreds of kilometers away. The consequences are parents lose their traditional and sustainable livelihoods, and even if their children, their boarding school, have also been moved to the same new area, parents no longer have their homeland to live in and pass on their ancestral knowledge of the land. This is how the Chinese Communist Party, to use their jargon, give full play to the children of Tibet. Their mother tongue is systematically devalued to nothing more than a language subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to our questioning. Uh, there will be this is a seven-minute round, so each member will have seven minutes uh, to ask questions. Uh, I will turn the floor over to Zaid Abutak. Well, thank you, and thanks uh, for appearing today before committee. Uh, it's uh, very obvious that the Chinese uh, regime and government is trying to to use um, uh, schooling uh, to be able to impact uh, changes on the culture of Tibet region and Tibetan in general. Uh, since 2008, uh, these uh, four boarding schools have been running, and they could probably be running from before that. Um, in your assessment, and the question I would like to start with Mr. Thurchin, uh, in, in your own assessment, how much of an impact have these boarding schools have left on the culture, on the language, on the committee in general? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Um, the impact of force, forcibly putting Tibetan children into residential boarding school has uh, created an environment where Tibetan children are no longer able to uh, communicate with their grandparents because grandparents would speak Tibetan and children would not be able to speak in Tibetan. It has cut off the link of sharing not just uh, the language, but also sharing the history of, uh, that grandparents would usually share to their grandchildren. That is just one example. Uh, but I would differ to our colleague at Tibet Action Institute, who has done uh, uh, research uh, and spent a lot of time on this particular issue. If I may add very quickly to what my colleague Sherabla just said, um, in terms of doing extensive research on the ground on exactly the scale, the scope and the scale of the impact, it's very difficult to do because the Chinese government does not allow any foreigner, any foreign researcher or scholar or independent investigators or journalists to go into Tibet. Uh, and they don't allow 
any information from Tibet to escape out of Tibet. In Tibet, one reason why there was an information black hole is um, the, the you know messengers get punished sometimes even worse than the protesters. Uh, at the same time, a couple of examples that I have uh, observed in my own experience. Uh, the age of the child seems to be very important in terms of how deep the level of impact is. Let's say if we just look at the individual impact of one on one family. Uh, my colleague, um, Dr. Gallo, who's here with us, uh, he observed that among children who are between the ages of three, four, to five, and six, among them, within the course of three to six months, that's long enough for a child to switch completely from Tibetan to Mandarin. And it basically literally takes less than six months for the language erosion to happen at a very fundamental uh, place. I also met a young Tibetan student around the age of 11 and 12, and this was somebody who attended one of those boarding institutions recently, and her story was a little bit different because she grew up in a family that was very fiercely proud of their Tibetan heritage. She grew up speaking only Tibetan in her home, and you know um, that was the language of the home. But when she was enrolled into boarding institution at age 10, within one year, Mandarin displaced Tibetan as her first language. When I met her, she was no longer comfortable speaking in Tibetan. She was speaking to me in halting Tibetan, and her first language was very clearly Mandarin. And I asked her, what about the other students in your school? In class, of course, you, you speak Mandarin, but outside of class, what language do you use with each other, with your peers? She said Mandarin, Chinese. On this note, uh, how long will it be uh, continuing uh, doing the residen residential schools? How long will it take to wipe out completely the, uh, the Tibet culture and language? And that's, that's, that's the implication that many of us really deeply worry about because it is one of those impact that is difficult to observe and difficult to notice because it starts, let's imagine, you know, in her case, students who are 11 to 12 years old right now, they already switch to Mandarin as their first language. We cannot say what's happening to people who are 16, 17, 18 years old. So it's easy for people to think that Tibetan language is still doing okay because people are still speaking Tibetan. But if we play this experiment forward, when her generation, when they get to 40 years old or 50 years old, we have a world where in Tibet, majority of the Tibetan population will be speaking in Chinese, not in Tibetan, to each other. There is nothing wrong with being bilingual, but there is something disturbing when Tibetans talk to each other in Chinese as their main language. And this is the real scenario that we are looking at because it's a cohort effect and it happens. Right now it's hard to notice, but when the world starts to notice, it might become too late. That's why right now is the time for action. So between the action on doing something with the very, very stubborn uh, regime uh, out there that is on a power trip, basically, uh, versus uh, the other countering action to be able to preserve and to uh, minimize the impact of the actions happening through uh, as a result of residential schools. What do you think the best uh, action can be done or can be taken to be able, as I said, to minimize the effect of what's going on? Un unfortunately, that puts us out of time uh, there, but we will be turning over to Mr. Varani uh, for another seven minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you for the welcome to the committee. Uh, I want to say thank you in Tujiche, especially to all of the witnesses in Tujiche, which means thank you in Tibetan to all of the witnesses, uh, virtual and in person, who have come to share such important information. It's not lost on me as a Muslim Canadian. Today is Eid al-Fitr, and as uh, Muslim Canadians are free to celebrate with their families, as I have been doing with my family today, uh, 
religious worship and religious freedom in other parts of the world, including in Tibet, is extremely restricted. And I think it just underscores the need for us to be all vigilant. Uh, so let me just start by saying that. Um, I wanted to put out a request to the first three witnesses. I, I was jotting down things as fast as possible, but I think between uh, Rinpoche La and Sherab Terchen and uh, Tenzin Dorje, you've provided about 12 different recommendations. If you could please just make sure all of those recommendations are provided in writing to the clerk and to the analyst, that would be very beneficial for us because we, won't, we do want to scrutinize those very closely. I want to start with my first question in these seven minutes, um, perhaps to the Tibet Action Institute uh, and uh, Tenzin Dorje La. Um, it seems to me that uh, Tibet, uh, by, given from what we've heard, is at a, a, an inflection point uh, where Canada was maybe around the 1870s or 1880s, just when we were designing the residential school system for Indigenous kids in this country, where the overt policy of the government of Canada at the time was to take the Indian out of the child. Uh, you said quite candidly, uh, uh, Tenzin La, that um, the PRC under Xi Jinping is just deliberately attempting to assimilate uh, Tibetans quite, quite directly by uh, converting to a complete usage of Mandarin. What analogies do you see between what happened in this country and unfortunately continues uh, to this day in Canada with the Indian residential school system where we took kids away from their indigenous homes and put them far away places, forcing them to learn English in a foreign language to what is happening right now in Tibet? And what lessons can we apply from our own experience to help the Tibetan cause? So if you could start with that, please, uh, Mr. Dorje. I think the two cases are very similar when it comes to the intent of the government, the main goal of the government, and many of the strategies that the government is using are also very similar. Some of the tactics might be a little bit different, but most of the strategies are the same, and the goal is exactly the same. The only major difference that I see is in the case of what China is doing to Tibet right now, it is not too late yet. There is time to stop it from happening. And if the phrase never again has any meaning, we have a chance to stop this genocide. Thank you, Dojila. If I could turn to Sherp, Tur Sherp Turchin from the CTC. Sherp, you talked about, I mean, obviously there's a moral flaw to what the PRC is doing. Uh, there's a violation of international human rights and you outlined some of the covenants. But it also seems that you're making the case that the Chinese government, even pursuant to their own domestic legislation, they're violating their own domestic laws, their own national laws in the PRC in terms of what they're doing to the Tibetan people. Can you just refresh us in terms of the legislation you feel is, is being violated? domestically by the, in terms of the PRC violating their own laws? Yes, um, certainly. Thank you for the question. When it comes to the practices of any policies uh, in Tibet by the Chinese government, the critical question remains, are they transparent? What about the actual implementation of the policies that exist only in theory? And this is where the idea of uh, fact-finding, independent visit, unrestricted visit to Tibet and other uh, autonomous part of China is very important. And in this regard, I would suggest the idea of uh, reciprocity, which is in 2018, we had Chinese government appointed officials visiting and testifying before the Foreign Affairs Committee and sharing their thoughts but we do not have the same opportunity for Canadian government officials, Canadian parliamentarians to visit Tibet and to see what is the actual situation. So to answer this question, I would suggest that uh, the reciprocal access to Tibet is very important. Okay, thank you, Sherpla. Um, and if I could turn to um, the, um, the abbot, uh, uh, Tenzin Thupten Rabgyalla. Uh, for this last question. I think it's fairly familiar to me. I mean, I'm the chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Tibet to, in terms of understanding the role of the Panjan Lama, but I'm not sure if it's fair or if it's crystal clear uh, to everyone uh, in this committee and people watching at home about the importance of the Panjan Lama vis-a-vis -vis the succession of the Dalai Lama. My understanding is that each recognizes each other's reincarnation and that the end strategic goal of the Chinese government is by controlling who is the Panjan Lama and effectively trying to replace the current Panchen Lama 
they control who would succeed the 14th Dalai Lama because the Panchen Lama identifies and recognizes what would be the 15th Dalai Lama. So can you just explain to viewers what is the strategic purpose that China is trying to achieve by abducting Gaiden Chokin Nima and also by trying to put someone in his as a replacement in his place? Uh, and thank you so much for being here, uh, Rabbi Allah. <coughs> ランゾペダヒマラヤツェベザミンギタミマサエマンブキケビユキンザウェラマチチギヨアレエデザムドマセベアニチダンランゾペギロソエレヤソンウエランゲメキソンソエレヤアネナムラニマダワサラジャワ
Thank you. Thank you so much. I think there is no there is no words to stress the importance of language to an individual, to a society, to a people, to a family. And sometimes I think we make a mistake when we think of language as a tool for communication between two people or between two uh, societies. Language is much more than a tool. It's, it's, it's the foundation for, uh, for being a human being. In some ways, it is what distinguishes us from all the others, right, as, as humans. And language is basically a way of thinking. It's a way of being in the world. And I was just speaking this morning with uh, Dr. Gallo about the importance, what it means to lose a language. When somebody loses their language, it's not the same as losing many other things that are important to a person. When you lose a language, the person who loses their mother tongue does not always gain another language at the same level. Usually they gain half a language. Usually they gain an incomplete language. And there are people who argue there is literature that says language basically determines thought, right? It determines our characteristics, personalities. It in, influences who we are, even at that level, then when we talk about losing a language, it is not only a traumatic loss for an individual, it's not only a traumatic loss for a nation, it's not only a loss for society or the relationships people have. We lose so much more that cannot be expressed enough through words. And I think that is the future that we are looking at if we fail, if the world fails to notice the alarming situation right now if we fail to respond to this alarm um, that the situation is right now. Thank you. Merci infiniment pour ça, je pense. Thank you for that. I believe that language is at the basis of how a person thinks, and that's why we may think differently based on our mother tongue. I believe that this is supported by a number of sociologists, in fact. Oh, I have a question now for my friend Churchin for the, from the Canada-Tibet Community. Are you taking a risk when you defend Tibet here when we hear about Chinese interference here in Canada. Is it difficult for you to do this? Do you feel safe in Canada when you defend Tibetans here and you defend the Tibetans that are at home? Um, thank you for the question. This, I think the threat is mainly um, applicable to Tibetans who still have families in Tibet. Uh, which is what Chinese government often uses to coerce, to self-censor Tibetans living in exile. And I didn't really have much fear uh, when I joined Tibet Advocacy, when I started speaking out for human rights in Tibet in Canada. But in recent time, uh, after hearing about more stories about Chinese influence and interferences in Canada, and especially after hearing the stories of how the existence of Chinese police stations in Canada, it really uh, gave me a sense of fear, whether I'm safe or not. So this is something that I've never felt uh, until two years ago. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Une minute. Thank you very much. One, I have a minute le left very quickly, um, Your Holiness. I would like to ask you, do you think that the parliamentarians at the House of Commons should support your five recommendations? And if we do, do you think that Canada will become an example throughout the world and other democratic uh, countries could perhaps follow suit? Thank <clears throat> you. 
Pinjerum Yes, Canada would be a leader uh, should the Parliament support the five appeals. We have big hope in Canada leading uh, that conversation because millions of followers of His Holiness the Penjan Rinpoche, who is namely the second highest Buddhist leader, um, this action by the Canadian government will support in raising awareness about uh, His Holiness the Penjan Rinpoche and extremely help. And not only will it help, we have high hopes that Canada will take lead on this. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to MP Pearson. Thank you very much, Merci. Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to all of the, the witnesses for coming and sharing this, this very difficult testimony. And similar to my, my colleague um, from the Liberal Party, and, and I should say uh, Eid Mubarak, um, I also see the, re the, the, the commonalities with the residential system that we've seen in Canada and, and uh, how you know, it seems like the same tools have been used to to um, destroy the the Tibetan people. Uh, obviously, extremely extremely upsetting. Uh, His Holiness just mentioned, just spoke a little bit about wanting Canada to be um, to take a leadership role in this. And I'd like to ask all three uh, all three witnesses if they could comment on what other countries have said, what other countries have been doing with regards to support. Um, I'd just like to get a sense of, of um, where, where that situation is. I know that it is always best if we can work with when, when dealing with the PRC, that it's always best if we can work with our allies, if we can work with other like-minded countries. Um, you know, as a block, it, it, it is an easier and, and more effective way of us, of us doing that work. I'm just wondering what, where other countries are at, what we've, if there are any that have been leading on this, any that have been doing really, really good work that we can, that we can look to. Perhaps I'll start with His Holiness, and then if the other our two witnesses would like to begin. <coughs> Chone, Arize, Teranashi, Canada, Teranashi, Europe, and Nikare, Tangu, Chick, Tanda Sosuki, Kang, Chasaki, Lumba, Manchab, Chasaki, Lumba, Tamegi, and Nikabjo, Tang Haleva, you had ever tended to chat in Shas. In short, um, wherever I've been able to visit, um, in terms of whether it is the United States here in Canada, across Europe, um, in India, in London, uh, where I'm about to go. Um, wherever I've been, we've seen immense support uh, in regards to His Holiness the Pinjin Rinpoche's case. I would say, you know, uh, there are certainly many other countries who have taken strong position on the issue of uh, not just the uh, human rights, but the political issue of Tibet as well. I would uh, cite the example of uh, the bills that were passed in the US uh, in the recent years. Reciprocal access to Tibet was passed in the US. Tibet Policy and Security Act was passed in the US. And currently, there's uh, a bill on uh, resolving this Sino-Tibetan conflict, which is also under uh, consideration for passing in the U.S. Co uh, Congress. And more at the multilateral platform, uh, I would, uh, I wanted to bring this example. Uh, I think it was about probably about uh, a little more than a year ago, when Canada's U.N. Ambassador Bob Ray mentioned. Uh, in response to a question uh, asked by Chinese representative there that, um, that Canada actually recognizes the acknowledgement and the reconciliation of its history with indigenous peoples. And this happens whenever there's in any international attempt to point out China's treatment of uh, uh, its national people, whether it's Tibetans, Uyghurs, or Mongolians. So China often uses this as a counterattack to point out as Western government, uh, reminding about their own history 
And this is where Bob Ray's answer, I thought, was a, a really uh, good answer. Mr. Dorsey, anything from, from Yeah, I'll just quickly add uh, also that two months ago, the United Nations released a very strong statement on this subject, uh, demanding that the Chinese government should abolish the entire colonial system of boarding schools in Tibet. And just yesterday, actually, the German government uh, from the Foreign Office took a stand and made a call, very strong call, to the Chinese government directly that they should close down the colonial boarding school system as well. Thank you. Mr. Dorji, how, do you, how, how would you evaluate um, Canada's response to date? H how do you feel that Canada is doing? I know that you've brought forward many recommendations that we can, um, that we can review, but, uh, but how do you feel to date that Canada has, has done? I think the fact that we're having this meeting is a recognition of uh, Canada's active interest on this issue. And the fact that we recently had on December 14, uh, unanimous, unanimously passed a uh, motion uh, supporting the resumption of Sino-Tibetan dialogue is a sign that Canada has uh, shown an increasing interest in resolving uh, the human rights issues, in resolving the Sino-Tibetan conflict. And uh, I hope there will be more interest. I hope this is just a start. I also feel that the response from the Canadian Parliament so far has been very encouraging to us. The fact that we are holding this hearing, uh, the Tibetan people are following this event, and we can assure you that people inside Tibet who really have no voice because they are being crushed by the Chinese government, people also from Tibet are following what the Canadian government and the parliament has been, uh, or, or you know, uh, governments around the world are taking action on this. And I believe that the Canadian government could go much further than, current, than currently and, in fact, take a much stronger stand from the government side, release statement from the highest levels of government, and make strong calls to the Chinese government on closing down this institution, especially because of our own history out here in North America. I think uh, this history, actually, the colonial history of what happened in Canada, places the Canadian government in an ironically, paradoxically, very, very powerful position of taking action on this issue. Thank you very much. I, I believe okay. I'm almost out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just was going to go around the, the room here, uh, canvas the MPs. I do want to do another round. I know that we have an hour of committee business coming up right after this. Um, I guess I would uh, look for a motion perhaps uh, to, to do one more round. Uh, is that, would that so be the will? Of... Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, so we'll do Mr. one more Mr. round. Uh, Mr. Five. Mr. Uh, Chair, just on an, an administrative point, if, if Mr. Dorje could provide to the committee the two statements that he mentioned to Ms. McPherson, so he mentioned a German government position and a UN report, I think that might be helpful for our analysis. Thanks, for Mr. sure, for sure. So we'll go to our second round. These will be five minute rounds of questioning. And uh, uh, first on the list, I have uh, MP Anita Vanderbilt. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, does this mean we will not have a second question for our side? Because if that's the case, I'll probably split my time with uh, with Ali. Yeah, I, I, yeah. My my understanding would be that we just do one more round. This is it. Okay. Uh, so yeah. I'll split. I'll split my time with uh, with Ali. So. Um, I'll, I'll try to be very quick, but I first want to say that uh, some of the things that you have testified today, particularly, you know, the the specter that we will have a generation that will lose their language and culture uh, if we don't take action now, uh, and also the the idea that children can't speak to their own grandparents, uh, I, I think for every one of us here is absolutely both heartbreaking, but also inspires anger and action. So thank you very much for testifying. Um, and I just have a, a quick question then for Mr. Cherkin. Cherkin. Um, you mentioned a couple of things. First of all, you mentioned human rights defenders and the need for Canada to do more to help 
the human rights defenders that need to come here. Uh, we have, through this committee, uh, created and, and first proposed, and now the government has created uh, 250 spots for human rights defenders annually to be able to come to Canada. Uh, do you think that this is something that we should expand and increase uh, and allow globally, but also for Tibetans, more human rights defenders as a unique stream of immigration, not as refugees or as immigrants, but um, specifically so they can come, and then if they need to return or stay here, it would be flexible? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question. Certainly, um, and I would say that the invitation, if, the, uh, uh, if there's a scope for expansion of the committee, invitation should be sent to Tibetan human rights defenders from inside Tibet. And uh, I think uh, we are, uh, many community members would know the story of Tibetan language advocate Tashi Wangchu, who was uh, sentenced to five years in prisons uh, just for advocating, just for speaking about the preservation and promotion of Tibetan language to New York Times uh, reporter. And Canadian government has issued statement uh, for the immediate and unconditional release of Tashi Wangchuk in the past. Uh, we have communicated with Canadian officials in Be uh, embassy in Beijing, and we're thankful that the embassy sent its official uh, to list, uh, try to get inside the court when there was uh, sentencing, uh, the hearing about his sentencing was about to happen. But unfortunately, and not surprisingly, uh, Canadian official as well as officials from other countries were not allowed to get inside the court to hear about the details. And th this is usually quite common to uh, many Tibetans, which is something that I've spoken in my previous uh, testimony at the Foreign Affairs Committee, where many Tibetan who are uh, political uh, prisoner of political conscience uh, do not have the rights to access to lawyers, do not have the rights to access to their families when they are detained. Thank you. Um, just a, a, a flip side about the human rights defenders that are still in Tibet uh, is those that are here, those of you who are here today. Uh, Mr. Chechen, you said something about um, that there's been a change in the last couple of years. And I wonder if there would be a need, if you think there would be a need for the federal government, maybe within the RCMP, to create some kind of a, a protective service, maybe a public person's protective service for people who are targeted specifically because of their activism. Is that something that uh, you would, and, and I'll ask for a very quick answer so I have some time for Mr. Asasi to ask. Oh, thank you for this very important question. I think the best person to really answer this question question would be my colleague who's actually sitting here today because Chimil Hamo uh, has actually been the victim of, uh, yes please Chimil. Yeah. Yes, to keep it short, but there's also a report by Amnesty International that has been presented multiple times. Uh, I've personally testified here more than twice um, with the recommendations and the first recommendation that's the low ball, low hanging fruit is a point person to be able to uh, direct resources or connect us to individuals that could support us because we've always gone round and round and round and never really had the support and my case was presented in 2019. Mm. We'll remember that for our recommendations. Uh, Mr. Asasi, I don't know if there's time left, but go ahead, please. I, I think I have 30 seconds. Thank you, Ms. Vandenbelt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll jump right in, um, and I will preface it by saying, as Canadians, we obviously understand uh, the significance of language and identity. I wanted to ask Mr. Turchin about the uh, GAC uh, uh, funding that was made available. You touched on it. Can you tell us about the significance of that and whether there is more funding that is uh, required going forward for preserving the Tibetan language? Um, as I mentioned in my opening remark, uh, GAC has funded uh, this, as far as my knowledge is concerned, this is the second project that has been funded in the last uh, six years. And the project is, is still going on. Uh, it is the project deals with helping Tibetan schools in India and Nepal, covering over 76 Tibetan schools, uh, offering them opportunity to learn in their own Tibetan language. And this is, we are talking about Tibetans in exile. And this presence, as I mentioned in opening, this presence and opportunity to show to Chinese government that Tibetans, if given an opportunity, could succeed 
and the Tibetan language, as my uh, colleague from Tibet Action Institute mentioned, that Tibetan as a language has all the qualities to, uh, uh, to succeed in whatever aspirations ones have. Uh, and the central Tibetan administration have uh, requested Canadian government for continuation of this funding. And I would uh, appeal to this committee for the continuation uh, of funding to Tibetan schools in India and Nepal. Thank you. We'll now move to MP uh, Abitaf for five minutes. Thank you. Um, the uh, Chinese government have signed into the United Nations Declaration uh, or uh, Convention, Article 26 uh, on education and the parents' right to choose the kind of education that shall be given to their children. Um, so what is going on here? Uh, the uh, Chinese government now uh, doing the opposite. Um, I would like to, uh, to know from you uh, whether um, there is a pressure on United, from the United Nations on, on the Chinese government to fulfill this, uh, this uh, signatory commitment. And um, uh, follow to that, uh, I would like, you, if you don't mind, to touch on the, uh, the role of the religious institutions in fulfilling the agenda of the Chinese government regarding Tibet. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the Chinese government has been responding to the world starting to criticize the institution of colonial boarding schools. And we have noticed after the United Nations sent a communication to Beijing, after seeing uh, news of hearings being held in U.S. Congress and now in the Canadian Parliament, the Chinese government is really taking this issue seriously. And contrary to the conventional wisdom, the wrong conventional wisdom that Chinese government doesn't care about what the world thinks, uh, nothing will move Beijing, uh, they are too powerful, they won't budge, contrary to all that, Beijing actually cares a lot and they have been responding from the highest levels writing in their own media channels about this issue and trying to fight us back. And that's why they're trying to come up with all these fictitious arguments about why Tibetans should be in boarding schools, why uh, Tibetan language does not, is not adequate for learning math and science. Uh, and I think if there is continual, continued uh, building of more pressure from the world, from governments, from uh, various organizations, I think it is possible for the Chinese government to budge and to change its behavior and to change its policy. And we've been hearing whispers that in some small uh, places, in some counties in Tibet, there seem to be new changes on the ground, um, some reversal of policies that are not written, that are not completely official yet, but some adaptation and changes happening on the ground, and we see these as signs that actually, if the world takes action, we can actually change China's behavior. Terrific. On the second question, if uh, Mr. Rabiagal can uh, advise us on, on this, I think this is a very important question, to know what the role of the religious uh, institutions uh, on fulfilling the uh, agenda of the Chinese government. Tadizo,你知道,他的公司本身的目前那点的调查呢,是不一样的,你公司本身的目前的确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定确定
อันนี้เดลาเลนตานายาตาอันนี้ลอบดาลสุกีเพจนังเคยาลสอบติงซุยทอลียาอันนี้จิกชุกุนซีกุนจินชุเบกิกอันนี้กุเลตะกุนซี
political indoctrination about how great the Chinese Communist Party is, how terrible the Japanese occupiers, the Japanese soldiers uh, are. And basically, you know, like that's just one example. And I've seen some of these textbooks with images that are extremely violent, extremely disturbing, extremely bloody, extremely gory. And that's the kind of books that are used to teach very young children starting from five or six years old. So that is the reality of the type of indoctrination and political education that they are getting. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Yes, so, Ms. Choi Ki, I have a question for you. You may know that myself and some of my colleagues here are banned from entering China. We cannot go to China for political reasons. But when we attack the political system in China, as we did for Uyghur rights, for example, when we talk about Tibetans, etc., we in turn are attacked and told, we are told that we are being racist and anti-Chinese. So I think that that's sort of Beijing's propaganda that is used here in the political space. And so I'm, I wonder, what do you think the impact of that propaganda is, and how do we avoid falling into that trap? Thank you, Mr. Brunel, for your question. It is, is about Tibetans and uh, many others that have been oppressed for years. I think that it is important to stay confident, to know that we are defending the right cause, the cause of truth, and that there can be no freedom in an occupied, occupied country. So we have been under Chinese occupation, and really the values that are precious to us uh, in uh, democratic countries uh, must be upheld. So even though on the surface the arguments against you can seem quite dangerous. We know that deep down we are defending values that are precious, and so are you. Thank you very much. Do I have some time left, Mr. Chair? Very quickly then, Mr. Dorji, in October 2020 in Foreign Policy magazine, you wrote an article in which you uh, underlined the uh, democratic promotion tools that had some uh, success in other places failed in Beijing because of the surveillance within China. And so how does China use data and uh, surveillance uh, to uh, oppress the Tibetan minority? Very quickly. Thank you. The Chinese government has been uh, very effective and, and rather successful at mobilizing um, big data totalitarianism and uh, various transnational tools of tyranny to silence Tibetans abroad in the world and also to repress Tibetans inside Tibet. And one key way that they use uh, to achieve this is by linking uh, Tibetans living in the diaspora to their family members in Tibet. And by using that linkage and using that relationship, they use family members who are in Tibet as the hostage, and they're quite blatant about it. And I know a lot of Tibetans who are Tibetan Americans or you know, Tibetan Canadians uh, who travel, who've traveled to Tibet, and they get told by these United Front minders explicitly and directly, you guys live out there in freedom, in the free world. But if you say anything critical of the Chinese government, just remember your family is right here under our thumb. And that's the explicit kind of threat that's, you know, uh, through which China is using a strategy to silence the world. Uh, within Tibet, there has been um, cases where DNA collection without consent has been taking place in schools, various communities, and there is still a lot of uh, question about exactly 
what the Chinese government is trying to do with this, but it's nothing benign. It's nothing good that's ever going to come out of this. Uh, so we do live in a very scary uh, time when the world could go in a very different place, and China is at the cutting edge, uh, leading in the in, in the frontier of how technologies are being mobilized to increase tyranny and the you know the dream that we had 20 years ago that the internet would liberate humanity would bring democracy uh, how technology technologies of liberation would help us instead the chinese government is playing a huge role in inverting this whole uh, logic and right now that's another reason why we have to be really careful and hold corporations, especially multinational corporations that are out here in the West that are benefiting from our democracy, that are benefiting from our freedom, but at the same time they are aiding, giving their software and aiding the Chinese government impose its tyranny not only in China but also abroad. And we have to hold these corporations accountable as well. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the witnesses. And I'll have five minutes from uh, MP McPherson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you again to the witnesses. You know, I'm very interested in that last question, and I think um, I think the chair had asked for a bit of a brief answer, but I'd like to explore that a little bit further. I actually just returned from from Taiwan, and I I saw there, um, you know, what the Taiwanese are are having to deal with with regards to misinformation and disinformation campaigns, with regards to the the um, cyber attacks that that they are receiving you know up to a million a day um that are that are happening we also know that the suppression of human rights with regards to the the uyghurs um you know in hong kong all of those things are are part of the uh, of this bigger picture of how we're seeing the, the prc um become increasingly belligerent I, i'm one of the members like um mr bernal Dusef, who is who has been banned from from visiting china I'd like to hear from from all of the witnesses about, you know, more information about how the PRC is hiding the human rights abuses that it's perpetrating, how it's silencing Tibetans, how it's using um, the 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 online tools to suppress information. If I could start as well with our with our guest from Tibet Watch, uh, we haven't had an opportunity to hear from her quite as much. So, Ms. Chucky, if if I could start with you. So, thank you for this very important question. It's all by design how they hide deliberately and intentionally, by all means, by using technology, uh, by having people uh, monitor online chat groups as well. Um, we have received reports of Tibetans who post just al Hakarsan, Happy White Wednesday, which is like a decentralized movement of celebrating Tibetan identity on the soul day of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We have people getting arrested for simple messages like that online. So there are people monitoring online communication. We have uh, huge cash rewards for people who report to the police uh, knowledge about Tibetans who have contacts with Tibetans living outside. Uh, cash rewards also for monitoring people crossing the border areas, as a result of which after 2008, there is just a trickle of Tibetan refugees being able to escape to Nepal. Um, and then... There are also CCP members in the monasteries. You know, uh, monasteries are learning centers where the whole pursuit of education is liberation from suffering and not just for oneself, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. But then since 2012, there are monastic management committees in monasteries where Chinese Communist Party members who are atheist permanently in there to monitor and oversee, supervise all the activities of the monks. Uh, we have case studies of how there are police stations constructed right next to a monastery in Tango County, for example. So chat groups monitored, online communication monitored, online posts on the individual social accounts monitored, live streaming is monitored as well. We have uh, information of Tibetan musicians stopping the, themselves from speaking in Tibetan because their live streaming will be shut down. I also have an evidence of a Tibetan mother and a children talking to each other on a live streaming. And this little boy who is just scribbling figures repetitively like any child would, 
and just innocently asking his mom, mom, if I speak in Tibetan in doing, which is like a video sharing platform, uh, they say that doing will, they will shut down our account. So I don't know whether I should speak in Tibetan or Chinese. And the mom has no answer. And the mom only says, uh, I know, I will ask, okay. And then the kid replies, okay, mom. And this is an online video sharing platform. The mother has no answer. Um, she has 26K followers, but then that's how it is. So, um, and Tibetans uh, are not able to escape. Uh, Tibetans are not, Tibetans have an endless list of thoughts in their mind. 